So I think we should uh, get started. Our first speaker is uh, Baroness Jenny Tons. She was the uh, Lib Dem Member of Parliament for Richmond Park. Um, she was uh, in the, when she was in the Commons, she was Liberal Democrat spokesman on international development and then on children. Um, and in uh, 2008, along with um, uh, several others, she was uh, she broke through the blockade of Gaza by vote, uh, vote and she visited Gaza, uh, among other things, which I'm sure you will hear about, ladies and gentlemen, Jenny Tong. Oh. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for inviting me tonight. Before I say what I'm going to say, can I give a big welcome to the Jewish Chronicle, because I'm sure they're here. I never know quite who it is, but I'm sure they're here, and I hope that I see someone smiling. Yes, sir. Um, thank, you, um, thank you for coming, and I hope we give you lots of things that you can say about this. The second thing I want to say is that however any of you in like to interpret my remarks, I am not anti-Semitic. In fact, I'm not anti very much at all, except injustice. And it is injustice that concerns me most. I am certainly anti the current Israeli government, and I am anti the Israel lobby that supports that government. But that is not being anti-Semitic, it is being anti the Israeli government and anti the Israeli lobby. Get it? Because it's very important to make that distinction. And whenever you talk on these issues, people will refuse to make that distinction and accuse you of anti-Semitism. So I give all of you who may be supporters of Palestinians in this room that warning. Because once they have decided to go for you, they will go for you Who's in they? a big way. Who's in they? a big way. There will be an opportunity they, for questions after They this. is the Israel lobby. I bear the scars. Now, it's an interesting word, apartheid. It means separation. We know that. We know that the Israelis don't like the word very much. I don't suppose the South Africans like the word very much. I certainly don't like the word. Never did. But if you go to the West Bank and Gaza and indeed into Israel itself, you will understand what it's all about. And one of the things that concerns me a lot is that whereas a lot of us activists who care about the Palestinian cause and want a just solution, whatever it may be, for the troubles in the Middle East, whoever we are, quite often, we have only seen a lot of one side and not the other. And I say to the people from the pro-Israel lobby, the Zionists, whoever you are, for goodness sake, try and fight. If you have to disguise yourself as a Palestinian, it's not difficult. Um, get into the West Bank and try and get into Gaza and see what is being done in your name. Because you will be very, very shocked indeed. Now, I expect all of you have heard, and you're going to hear a lot tonight, I'm sure, about what goes on. Um, the West Bank, which is occupied territory, it is territory that was given by the United Nations to the Palestinian people when they were thrown out of the rest of Palestine. Um, it is occupied by Israel. There is a security wall, an apartheid wall, a separation barrier between Israel and the West Bank. The West Bank is racked and wrecked by settlements, by the roads linking the settlements that only settlers can use. It is racked by the fact that 80% of the water is taken by Israel. And I'll tell you one little story. When I was in Bethlehem some years ago, there was water coming through the taps in Bethlehem one day a week. And as we drove back into Jerusalem that evening, we saw the sprinklers on the lawns in the settlements on the way to Jerusalem. That is the way water is squandered in Israel, and yet the Palestinians have very little. And what they have is polluted by 
sewage in most cases, particularly in Gaza, the pollution is absolutely appalling and makes the water undrinkable. So the West Bank is not a very nice place, especially as you have to go through checkpoints wherever you want to go, if you want to go to school, if you want to go to hospitals. There are checkpoints all over the place in Palestine itself, which are unpredictable and you don't know whether you're going to be held up or not. So if you want to see what it's like, and I must say the first time I went to the West Bank was in 2003, and I could not believe my eyes. I really could not believe what was going on. And there is one word that's, that sums the whole thing up, and that is humiliation. At every opportunity, Palestinians are humiliated, utterly humiliated by the Israeli soldiers and the officials in the West Bank. Now, if you go to Gaza, things are even worse. And a lot of people tell you about Gaza. Ken's been to Gaza, I've been to Gaza four or five times now. The thing that worries me most about Gaza is because there is very little food, the children are malnourished. They are also drinking polluted water from sewage and from nitrates in the soil and over salination because they can't get fresh water. The children are also traumatized by planes, targeted assassinations, planes coming over, sonic booms, the sort of fun the Israeli Air Force have by issuing sonic booms in the middle of the night. It frightens the children, in fact it terrifies the children. 60% of them are malnourished, probably over that percentage with their beds, they don't concentrate well at school and their education is scanty. Their nutrition is appalling. Now it seems to me that that given and including the imprisonment that is Gaza, they can't get in or out, that is setting up a school for terrorism for the future. What are those children going to do? It is a nightmare world for them. And I haven't mentioned East Jerusalem, I'm sure Garda, you will mention East Jerusalem, but the one other factor I want to mention is what is happening to Arabs within Israel itself. They are discriminated against in so many ways. You can look it up on websites, there are so many laws that make their life of a lower standard than that of Israeli citizens. For a start, there's the one big one called the law of return. Any Jew from anywhere in the world can go back to Israel and settle, or can go to Israel, never having been there in their lives. But those people, like Garda's family, for instance, cannot go back to Israel, where their villages were before 1948. They cannot even visit without a great deal of trouble, and as far as I'm unaware of people being able to visit. So the law of return in Israel applies only to Jews, and as you know, there has been a big fuss recently because the Jewish constitution is being changed and it is being declared a Jewish state for Jewish people. And if you don't like that, and of course a lot of Arab Israelis do not like that, um, well then, you're supposed to get out. Expenditure on schools, expenditure on health, expenditure on welfare are all much, much less, a tiny fraction of what is spent on Israeli citizens. It is discrimination of the highest order and the Arabs in Israel have a very difficult time indeed. Marriage laws are stacked against them. Um, one interesting thing I read today, I saw that um, Haredi Jews in Israel are exempt from doing military service in the IDF. Now, if Arab Israelis refuse to do military service in the IDF, and who would want to if you're an Arab citizen because you have to go and attack your own people in the West Bank? Who would want to? But though they are then not allowed to receive tu tuition fees if they want to go on to university. They have to serve in the IDF first. And I would like to know, someone may be able to tell me, if the same applies to Haredi Jews. 
are they excluded from tuition fees if they it, don't it would do be nice their to national have some service? Truth. It's a nonsense that our Well, I, not it's not language. a nonsense. Yeah, there will be it's a lie. It's, it's it's another it's example. Of it's a lie, like all of your lies. Right, there will be an opportunity. Another, 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 another example. <laughs> I just want to sum up because recently there has been something called the Russell Tribunal taking place in several places. Kangaroo Court. Shh. With a lot of international lawyers and eminent people taking part, and I will just read you what its summary says at the beginning. It will take me a minute or so. The tribunal finds that Israel subjects the Palestinian people to an institutionalized regime of domination amounting to apartheid as defined under international law. This discriminatory regime manifests itself in varying intensity and forms against different categories of Palestinians depending on their location. They declare it is apartheid. And one final word I would say, it's squeaking, it's a mouse in it, never mind. One final word, I would ask those people who support Israel in this room what on earth they think Israel is doing. In the long term, they have lost all their allies in the Middle East. They have no friends anymore. The Arab Spring will go on and make sure of that. What does Israel do? questions after all of these uh, uh, these contributions from the uh, from the panel and that if anyone is uh, found to be interrupting I will ask you to leave and I, I'm going to be quite uh, strict on that from now on so you have been warned. Why aren't people allowed to film if there's two other lots of people filming? Uh, there's the, people, people? the people who are, uh, uh, who are who have organized this are filming it it's their event and they've decided that they don't want any unauthorized films of this uh, of this event made. They paid for this room? Uh, they, they are part of this university, um, and uh, I dare say you are not. What are the university rules? Taxpayers. <laughs> taxpayers paid for the room. Uh, taxpayers paid for the room. Yeah, this university. Yeah. I was bringing taxpayers. We, we're not students here. Of students at this university, they put these events on. Therefore, they have the right to decide who films and who cannot. If you're unhappy you're with the, the rules, you know where the door is. What's the problem, though? <laughs> questions on the topic of who gets to film, are you be, have been warned that if you're filming and you're not the one authorised person, you will be asked to leave. And I'm, that's, that's not up for debate. Is this guy part of the university? Oh my oh, god. god. Are you part of the university? Can we please get on are with you? this event, please? Let me see your student card. What are you ashamed of? What you Nothing! Of? You're, you're writing down, 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 down report. Uh, I'm not going to have any discussion amongst the floor, at least not just yet. So, um, yes, the person in, in front of me is, has been authorised, um, and, uh, uh, and that's the end of it, okay? No, I'm not going to take any more questions on it, and you know where the door is. Let's get on We hope that you've enjoyed this program and that you've found it enlightening. Perhaps it will have motivated you to act on the information within. A couple of extra notes worth mentioning. There is a very distinct possibility that the United States will respond in a very devious and violent nature against those who wish for independence here in Hawaii. It wasn't so long ago that an incident occurred in Panama where an, an officer of the US military was shot and killed supposedly by Panamanian military forces. It was the death of that individual that motivated the invasion of Panama and ultimately the killing of thousands of Panamanians. Coincidentally, the United States was nearing its time to relinquish control of the Panama Canal to the Panamanians which of course it had no desire to do. So when we think about the reality of the hundreds of billions of dollars that stand to be lost in revenue from the Hawaiian Islands, but more importantly, 
the military strategic value that the United States is using Hawaii for to dominate the rest of the world, it is just a little bit frightening to think about what the United States can and will do to stop this effort for independence and justice. If they're able to invade a nation such as Panama over the death of one individual, it is very possible that they will create an incident here in Hawaii, perhaps a terrorist action, or the killing of a military person here as well, and use that as an excuse to use their military forces to quell and destroy the movement for independence here. I am personally aware of many individuals in Puerto Rico, a territory of the United States, 15 individuals to be exact, who had spent 14 years in prison for the charge of seditious conspiracy. Those same charges could be brought against myself or others within the movement, and we may very well end up in prison. There are many ways the United States could thwart this effort, and the only way that they will be able to do so is if the world allows it to happen. So this final message is an appeal to the conscience once again of all those watching to please not ignore what happens here in Hawaii. If you think once again that it won't impact you, please understand that it could very well, in fact, it will impact you eventually. What happens here is in the interests of everybody. And if justice is served, the world may very well indeed move in the right direction. It is my sincere hope, along with the Universal Kinship Society, that we do indeed do the right thing here in Hawaii. The time has come to move on in a better way for all. Let it start here. In ending our power war, Senator Kaka, do you have any questions of me? We've heard you for a long time now about what you believe that has happened. Amen. Our thrust here is to the future of our life. To the future, as you know, Richard, the world is changing. What's going to happen to our Hawaiian children as the world changes? Are we going to leave them where they are? Well, we're going to try to cocoa and help them so they can help themselves. This is a trust. We are setting up a process with this bill to look into, into, into a future self-determination. This bill is not to, to determine what we're going to do. This sets up a process for us to do it. That's what it does. The hard work is yet to come. And what's going to happen to what's best for the Hawaiians? i got to tell you now, I don't think I'll be alive. That's how long it's going to take. But to kill it now, kill it. To kill the hopes. I thank you very much for your response. I May I make a comment about our children? Madam, children Madam, I assure you, if you do not sit down, you will be removed. We I have been very generous with the rules of both the Senate and the House. Our children are suffering under CPS and PHS, and they are being sold. And that is why. We are in Madam, you will sit down immediately or you will be removed.
quite pleased to authorise it to uh, get rid of cameras if you need to. Thank a bit you. like a bit like Garza here. Yeah, very funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, back to you. Okay, now let, let's give another another diversionary tactic. Another one. Okay, um, I'm afraid it doesn't change the fact. What people don't, our friends here don't seem to understand. It doesn't change the facts. However much you divert uh, people's attentions, whatever fuss you make, doesn't change the reality. So the reality is that uh, the way Israel does it, as I was saying, is that on the face of it, you cannot point to any law, most laws rather, and say, ah, but in law it says an Arab and a non-Arab. If you look closely, you will see that that is actually not true either. First of all, I just want to make a few examples and then I will end this. First of all, the very definition of Israel as a Jewish state and a state for all the Jews of the world is a racist definition. <coughs> as simple as that. A state is a usually, as, as we understand it, a state made up of its citizens. It is not a state which is for a particular, particular group of humanity. Israel is a Jewish state by its, const by its uh, uh, founding document, because it doesn't have a constitution, by its founding document, and not only that, it's a state of all the Jews of the world. Imagine this idea. Not the people inside it, not the people inside, the people, all the, all the Jews of the world. So that's the first thing one has to consider. What kind of a definition is this of a state? Secondly, the law of return, the law of return, which has already been mentioned, is a very good example of precisely this kind of thinking, this discriminatory thinking. The law of return says that any Jew residing anywhere has the right to immigrate to Israel and on arriving will attain Israeli citizenship. However, at the same time, that right is not extended to the inhabitants of that land who were expelled by the creation of the state of Israel. Now, why is that? You must ask, what's wrong with the people, the inhabitants, coming to their previous land where they lived, which was their home. What's wrong with it? What is wrong with it? It's underpinned by international law. It's, there are UN resolutions about it. It's a natural right. Why does Israel object? Well, it's obvious. It objects because it is a Jewish state, i.e. it has to have a Jewish majority. Think about that. How can you imagine a state which stipulates that the majority of its inhabitants must be uh, uh, Muslim or Buddhist or cucumbers or whatever it is, <laughs> but but and, 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 and every effort is made to keep it like that. Of, quite clearly, therefore, you cannot let the inhabitants back. So that's the law of return. Now, who is a Jew? Who is a Jew? Now, here's a big problem, because when the founding of people of Israel laid out this vision of a state of the Jews. Who are the Jews? What is the definition of the Jew? Is it a somebody who practices the Jewish religion? What is it? Now, they has ne they've never been able to find an agreed position. They, at one time, at the beginning, they talked about a person born of a Jewish mother or uh, and or a person who had been converted according to an orth the orthodox uh, system. That's it. Nobody else. Over time, when they saw that they were drying up the number of them, well, where are they going to get the people? They started to make it much more elastic. So now, anybody who has a Jewish parent or a Jewish grandparent is, is now Jewish. Not only that, amongst the million immigrants right. from not Soviet, right, from Soviet okay, Russia... Okay, you have the opportunity to correct me during the question the, time, the, or I'll make sure the, that. Among the, the million um, immigrants from Russia, how many of you know that 40% of these people are not Jewish? They are not Jews. They go to Greek and Russian Orthodox churches in Israel. Okay, 40%. Not only that, but when they brought in the Ethiopian <coughs> Jews, they brought, they brought, in, they brought in the Ethiopian Jews, they even fishing for Jews in Peru, they've gone to India, anything. <coughs> You know what the main purpose of it is? 
it's that they should be non-Arab. Non-Arab. You can be, therefore, any sort of person. You can call yourself a Jew. As long as you're not an Arab, it's all right. And so, uh, I, just two more points. Uh, the, um, the question of uh, uh, the absentees. Now, if there is one system which should tell you everything there is that you need to know about the nature of the state, it's the question of the present absentees. Are people familiar with this term? Yes, but it's it's quite not extraordinary. Like the the uh, and I'm about to tell you what it is. You obviously don't know. I do know. The it. present absentees <laughs> are Palestinians. Palestinians who, at the time of the establishment of the state of Israel, were not in their normal place of residence. <laughs> now they could have been people who had gone and left, fled because of the war, or they could be people who were not in their particular villages when the war happened, had to fled to relatives, let's say, nearby. These people were pronounced by the Israeli government as, quote, absentees. And it enabled the government to take their land and property. There is one quarter of a million such Palestinian absentees in Israel today. These are people who cannot get their land or their property back from the Israeli government because they are absentees. Um, and um, uh, I want to end on the most important and significant aspect of apartheid in Israel, which should make it very clear to any doubters that this is an apartheid system, and that is the land question. I think people may know, many people may, many people may not, that in Israel, 93% of the land is held by the Jewish National Fund for Jews. It can never be sold or leased to non-Jews. As a result, the citizens of Israel who are Arabs cannot buy land in 93% of the country because they are not Jews. Now, if that isn't uh, discrimination or a part of, I really don't know what is. Uh, Jenny Tong mentioned the question of marriage. Uh, you know that if an Arab citizen of Israel marries a person who is not uh, uh, Israeli, but the whole point is the person is an, is an Arab. They are not allowed to live with their spouses. They should leave, they either can leave Israel or they can stay, but they cannot live with their spouses. I don't know what you call that. And finally, of course, <coughs> there is the Nakba law. That is the law that is being, being passed in the Israeli Knesset, which uh, says that uh, the Palestinian and Arab citizens of Israel cannot commemorate the Nakba, that is the 1948 dispossession. They have to only celebrate Israeli independence. So, uh, if anybody is in any doubt, as, as, as Jenny uh, suggested, take a plane, uh, don't even go to the West Bank, just go to Israel and just talk to people. You will see the amount of discrimination that the Arab citizens of Israel endure, not just them, but the Oriental Jews, and not just them, but the Ethiopians. Do you know that if an Ethiopian gives blood to the Israeli blood bank, People have objected because they don't want transfusion from an Ethiopian. Uh, they do not want to use that. So, in summary, uh, I think uh, it, it really the issue that, that we need to talk about is not is Israel an apartheid state. It quite evidently is. It is a form of apartheid. It's not like South Africa identically. No, it's not. But it doesn't have to be. You can be an apartheid state without being a replica of South Africa. That's the point. Such an apartheid state <coughs> must not be, does not deserve to be supported or to have apologists for it or to have people defend it. And I know that quite a few of my Jewish friends and people I've, I've, I've come across over the years, I live in Golders Green, by the way. What more do you want? <laughs> um, many of my Jewish friends uh, have felt the need to defend Israel yeah. blindly. They really are so hysterical. They can't pause for a moment to think, is it true? Because such is their psychological dependence on the idea of Israel 
that they feel personally threatened. We have examples of that too. Jenny who spoke about um, uh, how it's not anti-Semitic um, to uh, be anti-Israeli state. I think that's quite uh, quite poignant for, um, uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. Um, gave us a first-hand account of uh, what life was like both in the West Bank and Gaza and ended up with speaking about discrimination of the highest order. Um, then heard from Ken talk about treacherous governments, the importance of trade rather than handouts and described Israel as, um, as, my, as a microcosm of the world. Um, Dr. Gandhi Kami, we heard from just now, and she spoke about the dehumanisation of Palestinians and the people of Gaza in particular. She described the way how the way Palestinians are treated would be considered wholly unacceptable if it wasn't for this dehumanisation, and gave us a great view of real life in Israel, the occupied territories, and in particular for Arab citizens of Israel, and also to some extent for Ethiopian Jews. So thank you for, um, uh, uh, for those uh, discussions. So we're now gonna, I'm now going to open it up to the floor. I'm going to do so in quite a structured way, simply because of the kind of behaviour we've had so far. In my mind, I'm going to divide the room into four, and I'm going to take two questions from each quarter, and then I'm going to come to our panel to ask from. Because this, pan this part of the um, uh, room is quite so keen, I'm going to start with a different one. Um, <laughs> So, can we have hands up in this quarter, the rear, my right, towards the rear. Um, I see two hands. Gentlemen in the... Can you wave if, you're, uh, if you've got your hand up? There's two gentlemen there working with their hand up. I'm going to take um, from both of those. Gentlemen in the jacket towards the front and then the, another guy in the jacket behind. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, 70 years ago, uh, before the uh, Israelis, uh, or the Belford uh, Promise, as uh, it was exposed, uh, the Palestinians and the Jews were brothers, because basically the, uh, one of the facts that were, were not mentioned, that you cannot be anti-Semitic if Abraham himself is the father of your, or the grandfather of our Prophet Muhammad. So we can't be anti-Semitic for saying the truth, but obviously the media, when it's trying to force it, all those uh, ig uh, ignorant ideas for people uh, to trying to show the wrong facts uh, and put a facade and a face uh, behind the truth of, uh, for Muslims, uh, for instance. Before the 70 years ago, how did the pa Palestinians and the Jewish people live? We see in Saudi Arabia, we see the immigrants who came after the 60s when the war happened they used to tell us that we used to marry from Jewish and uh, people and we were like brothers and we, we, we used to leave our, the, our babies with the Jewish families and we were like brothers. How come after the invasion or after the, the war that happened in, six, in the 60s, it's totally different. It's, not, it's the, op, the complete opposite situation after the Belford Promise, which is really neglected but it's really uh, obvious and ex exposed all over the world. If you look it up, you'll, know, you'll see it. Thank you. I'm going to take another contribution and then come back to the panel. Now, another one from the same quarter of the room, just so it's easier in my mind. Yep. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to ask the panelists a question I've been um, perplexed about long, many years. I'm an immigrant from Iraq, and I'm now a British citizen. My children were born here, and they're automatically British citizens. And yet, the Palestinian Arabs living in uh, camps in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and so on. Third generation, fourth generation, still they are not allowed to have citizenship in the
want you to ask the panel, both sides, um, is Israel an apartheid state? Um, your answer, could you... No, sorry, we can't have that. We can't have that as a question. I'm very sorry. So... More than 100 students and faculty descended on the administration offices at Carleton University. They are demanding the president, so, Roseanne Runtet, overturn a ban on this poster and explain why it was torn down by security in the first place. Runtet true, refused to debate the issue or take questions. The use of the phrase Israeli Apartheid Week is about as close to hate speech as one can get without being arrested, and I'm not certain it doesn't actually cross that line. What I want to speak about this evening is the background to the Gaza massacre. Uh, I'm not trying to use that language for its incendiary value, but I don't think it can be properly described as a war when the ratio of those killed is 100 to 1. By any, any reasonable standard, uh, what we witnessed in the past couple of weeks was a massacre or a slaughter. Every time the Zionists act like bullies and they cause this enormous fuss that is completely disproportional to what was going on, a $700 donation, a, a little master's thesis, more and more people are seeing through it, right? And they're seeing this as a false claim of victimization. I think the most worrisome part is what happened in the legislature. Because according to, to various experts who, who really write about academic freedom, this is unprecedented. It's the first time that they can find that a Canadian master's student was criticized by uh, a government body. Speaker, uh, my question is for the uh, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Minister, Jewish groups are criticizing the University of Toronto for accepting a shockingly anti-Semitic master's thesis. What are you doing as Minister of Citizenship to stop the rising tide of anti-Semitism? Yes. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I deeply appreciate uh, the member opposite for raising this. I, too, was uh, greatly disturbed and, in fact, disgusted when I read the media reports. I have visited the occupied Palestinian territories. Israel will never get true security and safety through oppressing another people. Israel's deterrence capacity its capacity to terrorize the Arab world into submission, it slipped another notch. It was high time to find a defenseless target to annihilate. Enter Gaza, Israel's favorite shooting gallery. Protest to the University of Ottawa. The institution initially approved the poster, but then changed its mind and also banned it. 